Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And there are certain names in the Jewish world which every Jew seems to know. They're sort of our Jewish superstars. So if you're involved in Jewish life at all, care about the state of Israel, you surely know the name Michael Oren. Few people on the world Jewish stage today are as well known for their contribution to Jewish life than is Michael Oren. Michael is an American Jew raised in West Orange, New Jersey, in a family that cared deeply about the well-being of the state of Israel. His given name was Michael Bornstein, and his father, Lester, was a veteran of World War II who took part in D-Day at Normandy and then also served in the Korean War. Michael attended Columbia College, then earned a master's degree in international affairs, also from Columbia. By the way, he also has a PhD in history and Middle East studies from Princeton. And since Columbia, Michael has been a creative force in Jewish life and in Israeli life for more than 40 years as a noted historian, an award-winning author of three superb books related to Israel and the U.S.-Israeli relationship, Six Days of War, the war that changed the face of the Middle East, which won Michael the National Jewish Book Award, Power, Faith, and Fantasy, America in the Middle East, 1776, to the present, A History of American Involvement in the Middle East, which became a New York Times bestseller. Michael had made Aliyah in 1979, when he was 29 years old, took the Hebrew name Oren, which means pine tree in Hebrew, served in the Lebanon War in 1982, rising to the rank of major. And of course, Michael Oren became Israel's ambassador to the United States, a position he held from 2008 to 2013. It required him to give up his American citizenship. And during his time as U.S. ambassador, Michael became one of Israel's most articulate and effective diplomats and beloved on the American Jewish scene. His third nonfiction work is called Ally. It was a controversial retrospective of the Obama administration's diplomatic relationship with the state of Israel. And Michael has been pretty courageous in his critique of President Obama's policies with respect to Israel. And he was particularly critical of the president's Cairo speech. Since his term as U.S. Ambassador, Michael has served as a Knesset member in the Kulanu Party. But Michael is out of politics now and has time to engage in other pursuits. And one of those pursuits is writing fiction. He's written three books of fiction. And Michael Oren has now written a collection of short stories, which are simply amazing, beautifully written, moving, touching, disturbing, honest, thought-provoking, inspiring. They're all in his book entitled, The Night Archer which is the last story in the book that features stories about a ghost frustrated by his inability to communicate with the rather pathetic humans who live in the house, to a powerful story of a Holocaust survivor who's become a renowned literary figure 
who then falls passionately in love with his young intern and who at the time of the story lies in a hospital bed close to the end of his life, a story which moved me deeply. To a story about a young boy nearing bar mitzvah who has to endure his family Seder. What a scene. Mm -hmm. To hear his uncle berate his father for his father's support of Richard Nixon. And then only to learn a deep secret about his father during his annual search for the Afi Komen. And on and on and on, more than 50 short stories in the night orchard. And Michael Oren is an absolute pleasure to welcome you back to L'Chaim and JBS. Kola Kavod for writing a wonderful book of short stories. Mazal Tov. Again, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Mark. I'm listening to this introduction and I'm turning different shades of red and thinking, where were you when I needed you in Knesset? I just find this a fabulous book and it's not a secret, obviously, before we started the interview, you and I had a few moments off air and you showed me and they're in the bookcase behind you. I want you to take them out. Show me, show the audience the first fiction book you wrote. So this is a fiction book called Sand Devil. And it's, I, I, I think I'm, uh, I could be safe in saying it's the only book ever written, fiction, about the Negev, set in the Negev. It's three novellas. I lived in the Negev for years in stable care. You know, that's where Ben Gurion is from, where he's buried today, uh, and love the Negev. And so these are three stories set in the Negev about the people who live in the Negev, and some very strange people live in the Negev. My, um, my next book was called Reunion. Here it is. Um, and this is a deeply based on my father's World War II stories. I used to attend his reunions. Um, and if anything, my, my father read this book, he thought it was a, bit, a little bit too close to reality. Um, but it's really, a, a the, it's, it's really a disquisition on aging and what it means to age. So it has been a long time since I've been able to publish fiction. You, you don't know this perhaps, Mark, but under Israeli law, as under American law, if you are in high office, you cannot publish works. You can write them, but you can't publish them. So before going off to Knesset every morning, very early, I would sit down and write short stories. And when I came out of Knesset uh, last year, there I had these short stories almost ready to go. Michael, mm -hmm. how old is your father now? My father's 95. My mother's 92. And I live in, the same, live in the same house I grew up in in West Orange, New Jersey. They've never moved Amazing. out of that. Okay. Yeah. And what's his health? So it's very good. He's, you know, they're aged and they have, they have helped 24 seven, but they haven't gone into a home and they, my father adamantly refuses to go into a home and they have their independent life. I, I speak to them every night. It's been very difficult during this Corona period, my, my inability to get on a plane and visit them. Yes. All of us find this time very hard. Maybe we'll talk about it a little later on. Anyway, so did you know you had this book in you, Michael? I know I have fiction in me. I've been writing um, nonfiction, starting with poetry since I was 12 years old. I came home one day from school in sixth grade and sat down and started writing, and I haven't stopped since then. Uh, I published my first poem, believe it or not, in Seventeen magazine, and uh, <laughs> can't make this up. And then um, I, wrote a, I wrote a film when I was 17 years old that won the, um, the National Young Filmmakers Festival on PBS. Yeah. So yeah. I figured I was going to Hollywood. And, uh, and I went off to Hollywood. I don't know if you know this story. I became Orson Welles' assistant in Hollywood. Uh, very wait, funny. Wait, just a minute. <laughs> I know that about you, but I never... What was that like to be it was the from, assistant Orson Welles? Right. I, was, I have been, as you know, I've been in several wars. I think the wars were less frightening than working with Orson Welles. A horrific man, cursed everybody. I was terribly afraid he was going to curse me out. My job was to cut his cigar, I'm not making this up, to help him on and off with his cape, which weighed more than I did. He was about 500 pounds. I used to have to sweat, I have to sort of chamois the sweat from his forehead. From all this, I was paid a lot of money and um, in cash. And do you remember the Paul Masson wine commercials? Paul Masson said 100 years ago, no wine before it's time. I, I held the cue cards for that commercial. 
So, um, so I was going to, I had, a, I, I came to a crossroads. I either had to go in Hollywood or I had this other part hey, of me. One moment. Did you like him? Y you could not like him. He was not like a bull. Was, was the time with him well spent for you? Yes. It convinced me that maybe I shouldn't stay in Hollywood. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. After Hollywood? No, because I also had this other half of me. And I always had this, these two halves of me. One was the writing half, and the other was the Jewish Zionist half. Yes. And I was getting on an age. I wanted to be in the paratroopers very much. And uh, I was getting beyond the age where I could join the paratroopers. So uh, I decided to make this uh, Aliyah right after that. And okay. By the way, I, in one minute, I'm going to ask you about the storytelling in the Night Archer. But yes. since you have mentioned this, I heard you speak about a moment in your life, in your father's home, in your home growing up, which according to the way you told the story, had a formative impact on you. It was one day you came downstairs to breakfast and your father had a copy of that week's Look Life magazine. And there was a picture on the cover and i want you to tell the audience what was the picture on the cover what did your father say and how did it affect you well it was right after the six-day war and you gotta remember before the six-day war we all thought israel was going to be destroyed and my parents thought they'd be witnessing a second holocaust in one generation people forget that and on the seventh day as it were of the six day war, we woke up and there was a miracle and there was the front cover of the Life magazine with an Israeli soldier, Yossi ben Hanan, sitting with a, a captured Egyptian rifle over his head in the Suez Canal. And my father kissed that picture at the breakfast table. And of course, I wanted to be that soldier. Um, years later, I met Yossi ben Hanan. And I said to him, it's all your fault. All your fault, paratroopers. And I had to suffer and I went through war. And you know what he did, Mark? He stood up and he kissed me. That is lovely. What a great story. Um, okay, and again, I'm going to take one moment just to go down the personal storyline of your extraordinary life. I'm going to remind you of two other things I heard you say, nice. and I quote you, Michael, all the time. I thought they were brilliant. What you said was there were three experiences you had as a child. One was the experience of the Six-Day War and it, it is ultimately symbolized by this moment your father kisses the picture of the Israeli soldier with the Egyptian rifle carried as he goes through the Suez Canal. You mentioned the fact that you had to deal with anti-Semitism in school. You were the only Jew in a basically a Catholic populated school. And you Never. talked about the impact the Soviet... Jewry movement had on you. And people should know that at one point you represented the state of Israel almost as a secret agent in the Soviet Union. You were arrested numerous times by the KGB. But you talk about how those three events, Six Day War, anti Semitism, and the Soviet Jewry movement shaped who you are in a large degree. And Michael, how those same three experiences are no longer shared by young Jews today. Talk about that for a moment. Well, it's true. The anti semitism I grew up in a Catholic neighborhood and used to get beat up for being Jewish. And I would come home and my father would open up an album that he and his brother had put together from their time in World War II. Uh, they liberated concentration camps and there were piles of bodies in these pictures. And my father would point to those pictures and say, you see that? You see that, son? That's why, that's why we need a strong Israel. So that had a profound impact, too. Um, the Soviet Jewry movement, I mean, it's hard for young Jews today to imagine that when I grew up, there were three million Jews basically imprisoned who would go to prison, who would go to labor camp for studying Hebrew, for wanting to be Jews. It's, it's inconceivable today. And, you know, the, um, I think that when we grew up, can I say we? I don't know how old you are, but you know, we, I was very much in, in, imbued with American Jewish literature. I'm, I'm 
I'm a deep fan of Philip Roth. I think there's a, there are fi there are figures in this book of uh, of my short stories that are, that are Rothian, Bernard Malamud, um, Saul Bellow, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. Adam Bellow, the son of Saul, um, and basically you can summarize all of American Jewish literature, certainly in the post World War II period, up through the early 1980s, by one sentence, and the sentence is this: How can I be a Jew and an American at the same time? Yes. It's, it's the famous opening line to the, to the Adventures of Augie March by Saul Bellow. I am an American Chicago born. He has to declare that he's an American, okay? Young American Jews today, Mark, and they could even be Orthodox Jews, they don't have to be assimilated Jews, not only do not ask that question, they don't understand the question. Yes. They don't understand the question. So we are coming from a very, coming from a very different world uh, than they were. We're coming in a world where the state of Israel could have been destroyed. We're coming in a world where anti-Semitism was a daily event uh, for us. Um, not, you know, terrible things have happened in Pittsburgh and elsewhere in California, but that the average Jew would feel anti-Semitism the way I felt it, I had my nose broken, um, was, you know, pretty rare for an entire generation of young American Jews. And um, just as an aside, I have a novel coming out in April. It's called To, to, um, to, all those, to Those Who Call on Truth, To All Who Call on Truth. And it, it's set in 1972. There's a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism. And I feared that when I wrote the novel, American Jews wouldn't be able to rate, relate to this. But I wrote the novel before Pittsburgh. And I think in the aftermath of that, I think American Jews will understand what anti-Semitism far more they wouldn't have understood it say two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's difficult to understand a world where a major share of the Jewish people were basically imprisoned. And, um, and my involvement in the Soviet Jewry movement was truly, truly formative for me for many reasons, not the least of which is that I, I met simply the most courageous human beings that anybody could imagine. Yes. Yes. You were arrested by the KGB, yes? Many times. What was that like? Terrifying. We were told that, that if we get caught, we're on our own. And uh, we'd be in, you know, deep in the, in the Soviet Ukraine or elsewhere and being hauled in for interrogation at length uh, by the KGB. There was just, they could have done whatever they wanted to us. And uh, we were never sure whether we'd ever get out of there alive, me and my, uh, my partner in this. So, um, terrifying, but we drew a tremendous amount of courage and strength from the underground people we were working with, um, including, for example, the, the head of the Zionist underground in Odessa, who was a 16-year-old girl, no taller than five feet, who literally saved my life, literally. Wow. I was being, I, was, I walked into a KGB ambush, and there was big, uh, the Ukrainian KGB was totally Nazi. They looked like Nazis. Black you know, hats and black, tall black uh, capped peaked hats with, with leather jackets with, with, with you know, black jacks that were gonna hit me over the head. And she saw this and she threw herself bodily into the arms of one of these KGB thugs. And he lifted her up like this by the scruff of the neck. And she looked at him in the eye and said, what are you gonna do, hit me too? And they threw her down, they walked away, she saved our lives. And mm. we were arrested right after that. Mm. But still, so I mean, when you have people like that, who are willing to risk themselves for you, you know, the fact that you're going through a KGB interrogation, it's extremely unpleasant, but you have to draw strength from these, these extraordinary Jewish heroes around you. These were Lear live Jewish heroes. Um, I'm reading Natan Sharansky's book now, Gil Troy's book now, and um, it's a book I'll recommend, but to, and I know Natan's story very, very well, and I've worked with Natan. Uh, to read it again is very important, even for me to be reminded of what Jewish heroism was. Yes, yes. All right, we may come back to some of this later, but right now I want to talk about your book, The Night Archer. First of all, you are a brilliant storyteller. Thank and you. the series of marvelous short stories in this book are in one way or another, almost all about human relationships. Mm -hmm. now, Michael, in essence, is this a collection of stories you've written over time, or did you sit down to write a collection of stories for this book? 
I started writing this story when I was, um, I think in my second year of Knesset. And um, I didn't sit down to write a book. I did not. I just wrote short story after short story. Short. They kept on piling up. I was up at 5.30 this morning writing another short story. It's my second this week. And the two stories are completely different. And I set out to do uh, several things. One is, you know, I'm a big um, reader of short stories myself. And uh, the overwhelming majority of short story collections tend to, be have, tend to have a single setting. They can be set in a small New England town, or they can be set during a war, the Vietnam War. I wanted to write 50 or more stories that were completely, completely different. Um, told from different angles, different people, um, and not confine myself to one particular framework or even one style of writing. And this had many meanings for me. One was to reflect the, the various experiences I've had in life as a soldier, as a politician, a diplomat, an academician. There's some stories set in universities, as you know, as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather. All of these, these perspectives were very important to me. But I also wanted to say something. I wanted to say something about the human condition. And so there's a lot to be said about the human condition. And sometimes I have to say it as a soldier in war. And sometimes I have to say it as a detective uh, hunting down a murder mystery. Um, sometimes I have to say it as a ghost, as you know. Um, sometimes I can change gender. I can change orientation. I can change race. Um, but it was also extremely important to me, maybe supremely important, uh, to be free, to find freedom in stories, because that is what storytelling is about. You know, in your introduction, yes. you write that in some way, this book or life is the tension between freedom and limits and structure. And you try to explain to us before we read the actual stories that that tension is something that is reflected in your book. Talk to me for one moment about that tension between freedom and limits and structure as you feel it, it applies to life as a whole. And, I, and specifically to Jewish life. But let me start with life and then I'll talk about Jewish life, if you will. And that is that the, the true freedom um, always comes with, with, with restrictions. It, always, it is always uh, circumscribed in some way. Because without that, then freedom is just is anarchy, is chaos. And too many restrictions is tyranny. Um, and you have to find that balance. But in the writing world, whether you're writing poetry or short stories, it involves tremendous, tremendous discipline, sometimes agonizing discipline. Yes. You know, as a writer, you have to do in three pages what a novelist does in 300 pages, which is developing characters, uh, plot, drama, uh, dialogue in three pages. I wrote a short story this morning that was a page and a half. It was brutal, brutal to get everything into that page and a half. And uh, there's actually, the shorter the story, the harder it is. And so that is where on one hand, you're finding total freedom. You can be any place. You can be in the 14th century, you can be in the 15th century. You can be in a subway in New York City, or you can be in Jerusalem. But on the other hand, it's total discipline total writing what I would call the haiku of fiction. All right, you also say one more thing that fascinated me in the introduction. You write, your stories are, American in candor, Israeli in their zeal. <laughs> I'd like you to explain to me what you meant, what is American candor, and are you suggesting that candor is somehow an American quality that is not shared by Israel? And conversely, when you talk about Israeli in zeal, is there a zeal to the Israeli experience that you didn't find true in America? I think that America, and certainly America, literary America, uh, offered me vistas that were much more restrictive in Israel. It's a very smaller place much smaller place. So in, in, in writing about America, and not all my stories are set in America, as you know, but the ones are, I could be a homeless mother and her daughter traveling across the United States in a beat up automobile. That'd be hard to do in an Israeli setting. True? Mm -hmm. There is a, uh, there are stories, I'm trying to think of them very quickly on the, on the, on the there's stories about four 
Jewish women who attended an upscale New England summer camp as, as, young, as young girls, and something extraordinary happens to them in that camp that changes their life forever. And then as, as grown women, they try to have a reunion to re-experience that transformative event. And it's one of my favorite stories, but you couldn't set it in the state of Israel because we don't have camps like that here. <laughs> and and the, the revelation in the woods wouldn't have taken place because we don't have forests like that here, at least not, not, in the American, not in the New England sense. That has to do with setting. You yeah. used two words that I found so fascinating, candor and zeal. Candor has nothing to do with where it is. Candor is an attitude. Zeal is an attitude. And I'm asking you whether you really feel that those two words represent something about the respective culture of Israel and America that are unique to them. I think it's with me in Israel and me with America. Okay, not to, not to generalize, which is this. You know, if I give you a small example, Mark, did you know that in Israeli politics, you can never talk about your relationship with God? I did not know. Now, in America, you have to talk about your relationship with God. Donald Trump has to talk about his relationship with the God. But even a ultra-Orthodox member of Knesset can never talk about faith. Why you talk is about, that? Talk about mitzvahs, okay? Why? Talk about keeping the faith. You never talk about your relationship with God. In American politics, Israeli American politicians, I can say this is true as Barack Obama, could talk about issues that affected them as children that they had to overcome, about you know, hurdles through life. Um, I often used to hear about, you hear from Obama talking about what it was to grow up with his name, what it was to grow up with his ears, uh, everything. Israeli politicians never do that. Now that's what I mean by candor. I once talked about my relation, my, I'm, I'm a faithful person. I once talked about my faith publicly in Israel. I almost got excoriated. It's a cultural quirk. Mm -hmm. as, one, as one religious member of Knesset came up to me and said, TMI, it's too much information. Interesting. You know, it's, it is reflective of the Jewish tradition that ultimately the Jewish tradition cares how people behave and doesn't care terribly much about what we believe, although there's this sort of presumption that one is working out a relationship to God. And what I hear you're saying to me is that in some way, Israel reflects that in a formalized way. And therefore, when Michael Oren comes into the Knesset or becomes part of the diplomatic world, what your belief system is, is not something that you're expected to talk about. Yes? It's true. And it, it, it comes out in these stories, for example. As you know, if you've read them, you, you know that there are several stories about faith. Yes. About people of faith. There yes. are several stories about God, in which God is a character. Uh, you know, one of my favorite stories is a story called Day Eight. It takes place on the day I after. Love, by the way, I mm -hmm. love that story. Yeah. I wanted to ask you in general. Yes. How you imagined the theme of the various of, of these various stories? In other words, how do they come to you? And I've had the I've had the great privilege of having many really outstanding authors on L'chaim, Chaim Potok, Isaac Asimov, Isaac Basheva Singer. And I've asked all of them a question I want to ask you as well. And I will tell you what Isaac Basheva Singer answered me, but I want to hear your answer first. The question is, to what extent are any of these stories autobiographical? I don't mean that they literally happen to you but they come out of experiences of your life. And then we'll come back in one second to day eight, in which your depiction of God and his interchange with Satan or Satan is so fascinating to me. And I said to myself, I want to understand what Michael is really trying to say in this story. But first, to what, how do you imagine these themes and to what extent are they autobiographical? They're all autobiographical. You are so honest. I love <laughs> you. That's, that's American candor for you. They're all autobiographical. And let, let me just give you a small example. Uh, one, of the, one of the sort of out-of-box stories is called Fossils. 
And it's about two aged women walking on a beach. And what's unusual about these women is they're both retired school teachers and they're lovers and they've been lovers for many, many years. And it's about a painful event earlier than a relationship that is never quite healed and how they deal with it. Now you ask yourself, okay, um, an Israeli Jew, a former official living in the state of Israel, um, military veteran, what do I know about gay retired aged school teachers? And the answer is this. Um, I went to elementary school in the 1960s. Our, our teachers back then had been hired during the Great Repre Repression in the 1930s. And they, um, during the 1930s, if you were an unmarried woman, but let me rephrase this, if you were a married woman, you couldn't get a job as a teacher because the government you know, was very frugal in giving out jobs. And if you were married, then, then you, you're obviously your husband was, was the breadwinner and you didn't need a salary. So the women they hired as school teachers in the 1930s were uh, unmarried women. And it turns out many of these women were gay. And I didn't know this in the 1960s growing up as a kid, but all of my teachers were, for the most part, unmarried and gay. And some of them had relationships with one another that I found out later. So that's where that story comes from. Amazing. I don't want to give anything away on any of these stories. And I've tried, even as I mentioned them, not to give away the, I don't know, the reveal. But I just had a curiosity. The story, the boys' room. It actually happened to me. <laughs> it actually I want happened. People to read I want people to read it. Uh, okay. Incidentally, here's what Isaac Basheva Singer answered me. And tell me if it resonates with you. I said to him, to what extent are your stories are autobiographical? He said, everything I write has, is autobiographical, but it's colored by imagination. That's does, true. That, does that resonate with you? Uh-huh. Sure it does. Sure it does. It, it, it comes through a filter of imagination and, and may not be recognizable after it, but they're all... Uh, they're all autobiographical. Okay, um, so now come back to day eight. Yeah. And I'll try to set up day eight without giving anything away. And then you decide how you want to develop it. In day eight, it is the eighth day after the six days of creation plus Shabbat. And God looks at the world and he's pretty pleased with himself. But Satan, who is the puckest puckish like angel in rabbinic literature needles god and ultimately it turns out that in your version of the creation of man the human beings who are there at the end of the creation of seven six seven days do not have much of the soul that we associate with human beings and ultimately satan prods god into creating the human being that the jewish tradition knows and extols and then at the end of the story this is what you write god heard their prayers the human beings who have now evolved during this story god heard their prayers of thanks with difficulty, for they were drowned out by a cacophony of birds and the braying of lions laced with satanic chuckles. By the way, if anybody has any question of how brilliant a writer mm. Michael Oren is, that line in and of itself should tell you everything about how magnificent this book is. God heard their prayers of thanks with difficulty, for they were drowned out by a cacophony of birds, bring of lions, laced with satanic chuckles. Now, am I, is it fair for me to say to you that whole story was both troubling and moving at the same time? And I find the last line of the story to be fabulous. Speak to me about the story. Well, it goes to my own sort of internal uh, grappling 
with issues of faith. I mentioned that I'm a person of faith, but doesn't mean that I, I'm certain in my faith. And one of the big questions I think that, that I grapple with that Judaism wrestles with is that uh, if God is the creator of the universe, then God also created the chaos in the universe. Uh, God created evil in the universe. God created Satan. And the story is dealing with the question of whether the soul, uh, whether the, the, of all the creatures on this earth, human beings get impregnated with the soul. Um, is that the work of God or is that the work of Satan? And um, Satan certainly sees this as an opportunity. <laughs> Hence his laughter. He thinks he's pulled one over on God. By so, creating the human soul. By, by, by convincing God to give people souls. It's his opening. And you're, you're, it's a very important message that you're conveying in this short story. To what extent in your mind is the human soul guilty of something? Now, the, the human soul has potential for guilt. The human soul is, is, is vulnerable. And that's what, uh, that's what impregnating human beings with soul meant. It, it, was, it meant giving human beings the opportunity for transcendence, but also the, uh, the opportunity for sin. And, uh, and we have to recognize that. And that's something that, that, that Satan recognizes. He's, he's focusing on the sin side, not on the transcendent side. I think I, for a, more, a story that, that spoke to me quite deeply, and it's, I thought it would be much more controversial than it has proven to be. I don't know if people understand it fully, is a story that is actually set in a church. And it's called The Penitent. Penitent. And it's about a, a, a Sunday sermon given by a pastor uh, who has a rather controversial revelation to make to his church in the presence of his wife and two sons. And uh, I knew a lot about Christianity. Um, I studied Christianity as a young person. I was very interested in, in the New Testament as a Jewish book. I served as the advisor on church affairs to Yitzchak Rabin. And I've had a long association with, you know, the evangelical community and other religious communities in the United States. And so I, I, I know my, my churches very well. I know my service very well. And, and what I'm asking in that story is another Jewish question, though it's set in the church. And that is, is our relationship with God about what we want or with what God wants? Because the original Jewish notion is that God says to Abraham, everyone around you is committing sacrifices. Everyone around you is, you know, eating pork. But you're going to be different. You're going to cross over. You're going to be the Ivri. You're going to be the one who crosses over and be different. And Abraham says, Hineni. But in modern religion, we have much things, something which I would call almost sort of a, um, a, a neo-pantheism in the sense that you know, people go to the church or the synagogue where the God who resides in that house of worship is, some, is a God who agrees with what you think. So if, if you believe in gay marriage, it's like the God, the church or the synagogue you go to is going to believe in gay marriage. If you're against gay marriage, the same thing. Um, and so, you know, in the old sort of paganism, you've worshipped a God who was a person, who was a man, but now the God increasingly you worship as a person looks just like you. And this is what this story is dealing about. This dealing is about whether in religion we do what we want to do and whether our, our moral universes are fungible, or whether there's something that's permanent and something that's universal and above our whims. And that's what the story's about. That is very, that's wonderful and profound. You grew up in New Jersey in a mainstream conservative household, correct? Very assimilated household. Assimilated? Mm -hmm. A conservative in name, yeah, but, but assimilated. We didn't keep uh, kashrut, we didn't keep Shabbat. Um, I don't think anybody in my family had ever seen a page of Talmud. When your parents look at the journey you've taken in your own life, does it surprise them? Uh, <laughs> at times it has horrified them, yes. Uh, <laughs> It was a very Zionist house, and I think that um, yes. you know, from you know, from a Zionist youth movement, and say, "Dad, Mom, I, I want to move to Israel." It's sort of like you know, a Catholic kid going to Catholic school and coming home and tell his parents, "Hey, I want to be a priest," and and the parents are going to look at them, one another and say, "Hey, where do we go wrong?" 
Uh, what do you expect, mom and dad? So, uh, yeah, I think that the, up, up till, you know, relatively not too long ago, my father was still saying, you know, come home. Dad, I am home, I would say. Yes. Yes. By the way, it's hard to have a child who is a million miles away. That's what it feels like. And yet I'm sure he is extraordinary. Both your mother and father must be extraordinarily yeah. proud of their son and call it to you. Um, as you now look at your Judaism, and I had no idea we would go this down this path, but it's so fascinating to me. Michael, are you convinced there is a God? Yes. I'm not sure. I, 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 I cannot look at this country. I cannot look at Jewish history and not believe there's a purpose. There's a reason why, just to give you a, a purely random example, uh, a mere three years almost to the date after the greatest mass massacre in human history, where one third of all the Jews died, were, were killed and butchered by the Nazis, three years to the date, this state came into being with you know, fewer Jews than there are people in the city of Boston today and fought off six Arab armies and absorbed a million immigrants and built leading universities and an IDF, which is today more than twice as big as the large, twice as large as the British and French armies combined. How can you not? <laughs> How can you not believe that there's some purpose in all this? Now, does that mean I understand the purpose or not? I don't. And um, that is, I, I know I will be grappling this to my, my last day. There are certain things I do know. And part of that certainty is in this book. And I talk about it in the introduction that, that first of all, writing in general is very Jewish. We, we don't have much of an artistic tradition, you know, plastic arts. We don't have much of a music tradition in the Bible. You know, we don't know what the music sounded like, but we, we do have literature. We have a, a, a treasure trove of literature. And our literature is overwhelmingly short stories, a page and a half long. And you can sit and discuss that page and a half forever. Oh, my God. Um, and... It is a particular form, a Jewish form of freedom, Mark, which is freedom comes with limits. You, you yes. have the Exodus, but you also have Sinai. Yes. We have the holiday of Passover, the holiday of Afikoman, the story, where we're probably the only people in the world that has a holiday that celebrates freedom. But how do we celebrate it? With all sorts of additional restrictions. It's that, it's that Jewish paradox. And of that, I'm certain, and I live it. I asked you a moment ago, and I never followed up on it, the extent to which the stories are so varied in The Night Archer. But with The Night Archer is the final story. It is, is it fair for me to say it is somewhat enigmatic, Michael? <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, you know, I, I think in all my books, um, there was always a question of the title. And uh, in almost all my books, the title was changed at some point. Um, the Power, Faith, and Fantasy book was originally called Fantasy, Faith, and Power. But my editor said no man would ever buy a book that began with the word fantasy. No kidding. Um, the original title of this book was um, uh, The Presenting Problem is Not the Problem, because my mother was a family therapist, and she used to always say that to me, the presenting problem is not the problem. But my... Uh, my best, much better half, my wife, said, that's not a good title. Take the Night Archer. And I think she was right. The stories are so varied. Right. How it, it, do they just come to you? Do you struggle with finding themes? How do these fit oh. more than 50 <laughs> short stories? Each one, by the way, very different in subject. Uh, this, why and they're all again i said earlier in the open and you can disagree with me i find that in one way or another they're all involved in human relationships but they're done in such a way that the human relationships are all different facets it's as if there's this gem and as you twist it the light picks up different colors and all the different colors are reflected in these 50 plus stories. But is there anything, is there any process you use that you could explain to us? 
it's this. First of all, doing the dishes, I will be doing some physical activity and all of a sudden it's there. And my first reaction, Mark, is almost invariably, nah, I can't do that. That's too out of the box. That's too beyond my capabilities. You know, writing about an alien who's debating whether or not to land on planet Earth. To write about a tiger in the jungle who was having a lunch of a human being. <laughs> I gotta make myself a tiger. And I'll think to myself, what, what, what? That's crazy, what's the Michigan thing here? And, and then I sit down at the, at the computer, the screen is blank. That talk about terrifying things, a blank screen. And then I have a visualization of a story that looks like this. It's like, it's like building a suspension bridge. Those of you in the New York area know the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, right? And I see where the bridge begins on one store, on one shore, and I see where it ends on the other shore, but I don't know how it meets in the middle. And I think my task as a writer is to get the two edges of the bridge to meet in the middle and to be sustainable, to hold up. And it's, it's literally a visualization like that. Um, that's how I wrote that story this morning. That's beautiful. Or well, I want you to tell me about another story that I found particularly moving. And the extent to which you've already said all of your stories are in some way autobiographical. I want to know the, if the extent to which this comes out of a personal experience. The story is Beautiful Bivouac, and it begins uh -huh. with somebody seeing an artillery shell exploding in the distance, and the suggestion is this soldier looks at it and says out loud that it's beautiful. And the other soldier, the other Israeli soldier who is there, says, no, it isn't. And from there, this short story proceeds. Tell me about that story. Well, you know, I spent many years in the military, and, um, and I participated in several wars and operations. And many writers who go through war find that that's all they can write about. Um, James Jones, uh, Tim O'Brien, a brilliant short story writer, writes about Vietnam over and over again. And I have taken all these years and all these war experiences and put them into about a page. It's one of the shortest stories in the collection, Beautiful Bivouac. And it begins with a scene that actually happened. Um, I was sitting with a group of paratroopers around a, a makeshift fire and the phosphorus shell went off on a ridge not far from us. And one of the soldiers said, it's beautiful because phosphorus goes off with all these like floral designs. It's quite, it is quite beautiful objectively. Uh, it would be great on the 4th of July. And other soldiers said, no, it's ugly. And that's where the story begins. But that's not what the story's about. The story's yeah. about what goes on in an inner life of a soldier. And yes, there's fear, but there are other feelings, even at the height of war. Um, are you socially uh, acceptable? Um, do you meet your father's expectations? Um, and all this is going on in the mind of a soldier. Now, what's going on around him were things that really happened, because I've experienced war. And I know it's sights and smells and feelings. But the inner life is what the story is really about. It's really not about war. It's about, as you say, the human condition. Well, I, I think it is, I mean, there are many wonderful stories. That story really grabbed me also. Michael, do you think Americans, and maybe, I don't think it's true of Israelis, but do you think Americans romanticize war because most Americans, your father not included, his generation was a different generation. Most Americans have never experienced war. What you just said to me was the sounds and the smells of war. I've talked to people who have been in, the, have been in battle and who say no matter what a movie conveys, it doesn't convey the smell of, the, of what happens to people when they are killed and when they're shot to death or when they're lying dying. But Americans romanticize war and they especially romanticize, American Jews, especially romanticize the wars that Israel has fought. And I 
my instinct is, and what I've learned from people I have had the chance to speak with, is Israelis who have been through war, A, never want to talk about it, and B, for them, it's not about romance. It's about horror. And I want you to speak to that for a moment. I can say is yes. I don't talk about my war experiences, and, and uh, you know, most of them are not even in this story. Um, and I don't talk about them with my family members in any good, occasionally with my wife, but that's about it. And that's only because I'm not sleeping for some reason. I don't talk about it. And um, it, what can I say? That it, it, there, is, there is something untranslatable about it. And uh, the most terrific war movie you see is not going to capture it. Not just the smells, and not just the smells. And uh, I remember going to see Saving Private Ryan in the late 90s, which was a very violent movie when it came out. Um, I think audiences have been desensitized to that since then. But um, seeing that movie and thinking, this is really horrible, but it's not real. It's not as bad as the real thing. Yes. The real thing's worse. And what you called it earlier, it was, the War of Independence may have been a form of miracle. The Six Day War was miraculous. Um, but American Jews have invested a great deal of themselves in the wars that Israel has fought. And I'm just wondering, given your breadth of experience, how you feel about that? I think I'm fine with it. It's important that, that, we, that Israel serves a source of pride. And uh, certainly for my generation that grew up with a sense, okay, my father fought in World War II, but American Jewry did not stand up for European Jewry during World War II. We were a failure. And the Six-Day War, we used to say, you know, the, it, the Six-Day War enabled us as American Jews to stand with our backs straight. You remember that? Um, why were we standing with backs bowed before that? Because we, we had been humiliated by our failure to act during World War II. So, I, you know, I'm willing to put up with whatever internal, you know, nightmares and demons I have from these um, to give uh, American Jews that sense of pride. What's interesting is, you know, I was a lone soldier and a lone soldier at a time when people didn't know what lone soldiers were and we didn't have many benefits. And so many um, American Jewish youth, have, men and women have come up to me and have read my books and said, I want to be a lone soldier like you. I want to go and be a paratrooper. I want to go be a commando. And I'll say to them, that's terrific. That's wonderful. It could be a transformative experience for you as it was for me. But l you cannot be under any uh, delusions here. And that is, this is an army. And when you go to war, you can come home without eyes, without limbs. You can come home in the wheelchair. You cannot come home at all. And I've known more than a few who haven't come home. And I have to be very upfront with them about that. Very upfront. Mm -hmm. Michael, you have done so many things professionally, and in your life as, just as a human being. Um, and you, you speak to me in this conversation as an author, as a writer, as an artist who uses you know, the written word to express your art. At the moment, and I want to know whether this moment is different for you when I ask the question, than if I had asked this question of you 10 years ago, what's your self image? <laughs> your Who is Michael? What are you most? Are you, I mean, you are so, you've been so many different things and you've done them all so well. You know, you, you were a world-class historian. You were the ambassador for the state of Israel to the United States and now, you're invested yeah. in writing fiction and you talk to me as other people who've done nothing their whole lives but write. You talk to me that way. And I, I'm saying to myself, who is he? And <laughs> it's not who is he to me. Who, yeah. is he to, who are you to you right now, Michael? See, what you see as divisions, uh, the ambassador, statesman, soldier, historian, uh, writer, I see as part of a whole, and I'm I'm just myself, and uh, and there are parts of it that are that speak more deeply to me. You know, I always say that when I when I write history, it comes from here up, and when I write fiction, it starts here down. 
and I can, I can write a short story in the morning and then turn around and write a, you know, an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, as I did this week. Um, and it comes from, it doesn't, it doesn't impact one or the other because it's all part of, it's part of a whole. And the great, if you would, the great struggle of my life has been trying to sort of integrate the whole. Yes. Because I mean, before how I went off to Hollywood, but I wanted to be the paratrooper. And how do you be, how do you work with Orson Welles and be a paratrooper at the same time? Um, it hasn't always been easy. And there's been times when I've had to make sacrifices to be, to emphasize one part over another. For example, the time when I was in government where I couldn't publish a story. And writers, you know, what can we do? We have to publish. It's like, it's like being a, a, a concert violinist who never plays in a concert. Okay, he only plays in the back room. You gotta be able to talk to people. You gotta be able to have this discussion. Um, you wanna impact people with your writing and reach them with your writing, but you can't do it because you wanna serve the state of Israel too. And the state of Israel has called upon you to have, be in that type of role at that particular moment. So you say, okay, I'm gonna put it aside for a while. And you know, we haven't talked about this, but I remain very politically active here. Um, I'm very outspoken. Um, I was on Israeli radio this morning. I'm usually in the press. Um, I haven't cut back at all on that. And it's a balance, but it's all part of the same poll. Well, you've done each part of it so very, very well. So, Michael, I can't have you on without asking you to at least give me a, I mean, one of the things that I didn't list when I went through all the things you are, is you are a social commentator and a political commentator. And you've done it professionally, and you write all the time. And I, I mentioned in the open, you have been very courageous, not simply about looking back at the Obama administration, but you don't pull punches, and you say what you really believe about whatever you're talking about, whatever, whether it's politics in Israel or the American scene. So... I should ask you, as somebody who is constantly analyzing where we are politically in Israel and in the United States, what's your sense right now? Give us from inside Israel, what's your sense of how the Israeli people are relating to the Netanyahu Gantz unity government? Mm -hmm. What's the feel today? Uh, is it optimistic, pessimistic? Is it jaded? Is it skeptical? Is it, what's the mood in terms yeah. of, if I talk to people on, you know, Ben Yehuda Street, or you live in Tel Aviv, I'm at Bezengoff Square. What's the sense people have of where Israel is politically today? Uh, I think nobody's very optimistic. I think there's a tremendous uh, crisis of credibility in the government and its inability to deal effectively uh, with Corona, uh, to preserve the economy, um, to isolate those areas that need to be isolated in this country, um, for even members of the Israeli government to feel that they too are subject to these restrictions. And almost every day we have some story of some minister who's been caught violating the restrictions which he or she voted for. So a deep, deep credibility crisis in our leadership, and it's very disturbing to me. Um, a project that I have embarked on since Corona is called Israel 2048, the Rejuvenated State. And it's a collection of essays that I put together that summarize my 40 years of, of government service and military service. I started writing it or thinking about it when I was in the prime minister's office. I was the deputy to the prime minister uh, for four years. And, um, and when I came out of government, I worked on it with Nathan Sharansky for a while in the Hartman Institute. And Corona's given me an opportunity to sit down and write it. So now it's a document of about 50 pages, which discuss what Israel should look like in the year 2048, which is his 100th birthday. And what are the policy changes we need to make now to ensure that our next 100 years will be as successful as our first 100 years? And what are you suggesting? Oh, it's everything. It's economic policy, it's military policy, it's foreign policy, it's Jewish policy, it's health and education policy, every field you can imagine. And every couple several weeks, we do a Zoom conversation. And if any of your listeners want to be on the Zoom conversation, they can get in touch. And we discuss one of these, uh, one of these chapters. Uh, our last Zoom conversation, uh, hosted by Gil Troy, was um, about the foreign policy, the future of Israeli foreign policy. 
and how we have to restructure the foreign ministry. Um, and someday I'd like to turn this, this, this manifesto, as we call it, into a full-fledged book. Uh, Israel 2008, 2048, the rejuvenated state, and translate it into Hebrew and get it out to, and start having these discussions, not just in English, but around, around the whole country. Because one of the problems we face, maybe the core problem we face, is, is the absence of vision. And this country was created through vision, by visionaries. And we seem to have lost that ability. And we have to regain it if we're going to have, if we're going to not just survive, but thrive uh, through our next hundred years. Do Israelis see on the uh, Israeli political scene figures whom they have regard for and trust in? Few. Few. I mean, I'm saying this also because the, to be the prime minister of Israel is simply the hardest job in the world. Believe, believe me, I've worked around presidents, I've worked around prime ministers. There's nothing harder than being prime minister of Israel. There's no vacations, there's no golf vacations, there's no weekends, there's no nights. And there are very, very few people in any case who physically and mentally can do that. And of those people, um, their prestige, their credibility, not to overuse this word, has been, has been severely impaired by the serial elections we've had, by the political instability, and now by uh, the failure to grapple successfully with Corona. I, you know, I understand how government after government has struggled with this. And I, you know, I mean, in America, there's enormous criticism of the Trump administration. In Israel, there's enormous criticism because Israel seemed to be doing very, very well and then has taken a very bad turn. But in part, the corona period is a abnormal, it, it, it's, a, it's a moment in time which at some point is going to end. And what I was really asking you was, prior to corona, you had three rounds of elections that ultimately resulted in a unity government where you had Netanyahu and Gantz agreeing to share the position of leadership before Corona and then after Corona, do you feel Israelis were, were they heartened by the Netanyahu-Gantz alliance? Did they think it was silly? Do you think if Corona had not occurred, would the Netanyahu-Gantz government have been the first to, to fulfill a four-year term in ages in Israel? What's mm -hmm. your sense in that perspective? Depends who you ask. You can't generalize about Israelis. So uh, a portion of the, government, of the population would say they, they, they love Netanyahu irrespective. And whatever he said was going to be good. But for a very large percentage of the population, I'm not saying an absolute majority, but a very large percentage of the population, a, a prime minister who's facing three corruption charges should not be prime minister. And Benny Gantz, who had run on a platform saying, I would never join uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in a national unity government, and I believe that he should resign uh, and face uh, his charges in court as a citizen and not as prime minister, uh, violated all his campaign uh, promises. Now, he may have violated for noble purposes of saving Israel from corona, but, um, but for the, again, the vast majority of his voters uh, are not his voters anymore. They're down to single digit uh, support uh, in the Israeli population. So um, I think that, that the corona simply took a process that was happening anyway and both accelerated and amplified it and brought it to the point where literally under our window here in Jaffa two nights ago, there was a, a huge, loud and violent demonstration. And these are going to continue to break out throughout the entire country. All right. One more area here, because... Michael, you have an unusual perspective on both the Israeli scene and the American scene. Mm -hmm. And you know American Jewry so well. You, you referenced this early in this discussion, and I said we would come back to it. It has to do with your pointing out that today's young American Jew doesn't even ask the question that was the question being asked by all the Jewish authors at one point in time, namely, what's it mean to be an American and a Jew? 
Today, America faces the question of an, up, uh, an impending election. And as we're doing this, we're talking about roughly a month away. At the moment, Donald Trump has been diagnosed with corona, which who knows how that's going to impact the election. But traditionally, American Jewry has been overwhelmingly pro-democratic party. 70% more voted for Obama twice, and that's just typical of where the American Jewish community is. And the American Jewish community, the majority of American Jews loathe Trump. There is no way to overstate how much they hate who he is. And then there are Jews who see themselves as sort of the a last line of defense for the state of Israel. And there are American Jews who feel that there are so many Americans who care about America in it as a whole, that while American Jews still care passionately about the well-being of America, there are Jews who also care about the future of Israel. And they feel that decisions made in America by an American administration will ultimately help or hurt the state of Israel. Trump has seemed to be very much pro-Israel. And those American Jews who love Trump, love Trump in large measure for the things he's done about moving the embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing the Golan Heights. And now he seems to have been able to broker a deal between Israel and the Arab Emirates that is spectacular in its potential. And so they feel that after a difficult relationship with Obama, which you have been very outspoken about, Trump, for all of his shortcomings, the fact that he has been so good for Israel moves them to want to support him despite the nonsense. Now, you're an, Is you're an American who made Aliyah, and you, for a long time you had dual citizenship. You had to give it up to become ambassador. But you understand who American Jewry is. What's your take on this dilemma facing even many Jews who have been traditionally Democrat? who now look at the Democratic Party, worry that it's moving further against Israel, see Trump as somebody who has been marvelous for Israel, and in November is going to have to go to the polls and vote for either Joe Biden and the Democratic Party or four more years of Donald Trump. To what oh, extent, yeah. as, a, as an Israeli who also knows America so well, has Trump been good for Israel, and will it hurt Israel if Trump loses? I'm not in office now, but I still feel that I have a, a, a moral and fiduciary duty not to be involved in the American political scene. I will only say this, and that is, you know, I, I know Joe Biden very well. I know Senator Harris uh, pretty well. I escorted her to Israel here. Um, and I know that they're both deeply pro-Israel. They're very supportive of the U.S.-Israel alliance. They will never use U.S. aid to Israel as a means of pressuring Israel. They've gone on the record saying that. But having said that, there are two major policy differences we're going to have should they win, should the Democratic ticket win. One will be on the Palestinian issue and the other will be on the Iranian issue. Um, and certainly the Iranian issue is one that goes to the very heart of Israel's security to the future of our children and grandchildren. So these, these are substantive matters, not political. And I think that while I can't, you know, call a decision for, for American Jews, including my own family, who are overwhelmingly democratic, like the majority of American Jews, uh, who care about the composition of the Supreme Court and other issues, anti-Semitism, uh, they should be aware that these two major policy differences agree should the Democrats win, Israel is going to have to deal with that to the best we can. And we 
dealt with the Obama administration the best we can. The differences there were very stark and deep indeed. Um, at the end of the day, there's no substitute for America as Israel's ultimate ally. Um, there's no substitute for the American Jewish community as the second largest Jewish community in the world. And together, we are the Jewish people for so much, you know, in, in the main. And, and we're just going to have to make the best of it, irrespective of what happens. Okay. And last, as you look at American Jewry today, there are many American Jews and many Israelis who worry for the future of American Jewish life. And it's not simply, you know, it's not about anti-Semitism. It's about what's happening inside the Jewish community. That there, you know, there are fewer and fewer Jews who are educated. And while you say that you grew up in an assimilated conservative Jewish home, assimilation is much more a reality today than when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. And the extent to which American Jews retain a sense of Jewish peoplehood will have a very positive effect or a negative effect on American Jewish relationship to the state of Israel. Where do you see American Jewry today? What concerns you most that if you, you know, if if you were speaking right now in West Orange, New Jersey at a synagogue, what would your message be for American Jewry? Well, my concerns, of course, have to do with assimilation, has to do with alienation from the Jewish state. But I would say that, um, that see our situation today, whether you are American Jew or an Israeli Jew, see our situation today in a historical context. Um, think of what it would be like to talk to our great grandparents in Europe in the panel of settlements and ask them, you know, how much difficulty they would have with the fact that Israel, an independent, strong, proud Jewish state in the land of Israel, you know, had some political problems with Palestinians or others. And, you know, and I think our grand grandparents would look at us and say, what are you crazy? You've been given the greatest miracle in Jewish history. All right. So start being, start, start showing some gratitude. And this is what I said, I think, in my book, An Ally. It's about, about gratitude. Yes. And I think I'm profoundly thankful. But are you worried about the level of assimilation here? Of course. Do you, do you look at American Jewry and think to yourself, it's only a matter of time, and there won't be anything but an orthodox remnant in American Jewry? I don't know. Um, but I also know that uh, the Orthodox uh, uh, family size is quite large, and it could be 40, 50 few years from now, you'll have an American Jewish community, which could be as large as it is today. It'll just be overwhelmingly Orthodox and very close to the state of Israel. Um, you know, I always say I'm an historian and I have enough problems predicting the past. Um, but I personally have, have, a, have, a, have a sense of optimism about the future for American Jewry. That is a lovely point to end with. Look, I'll say it again. I love your book. Um, the Night Archer. I hope everyone picks it up. Thank you. you are an extraordinary writer. By the way, you're working on your next book, you said. I'm already well into my second collection of short stories. Yes. Good for you. Anyway, I always love it when you make time for me and for JBS. I wish you called Tuva Hatzlecha in all the work you do. And I hope you'll let me keep, you know, chasing you and, Please, and anytime. The opportunities to share your insight on a whole host of topics with our audience. But for right now, I thank you so much for giving us time and called two mahats on the book. Well, Take care. Thank you so much. Be well. The thoughts of Michael Oren, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, noted historian, and the author of a marvelous collection of short stories in a book entitled The Night Archer. I recommend it highly. As always, I'd love you to hear any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me at rabbigalab at jbstv.org. And also remember, you can now take L'Chaim with you anywhere you go as a podcast. Just wherever you download your podcasts, you'll find the L'Chaim podcast. 
And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.